Last time, as you recall, uh, we were talking about the pre-Socratic philosophers uh, in the fashion that they're usually represented in histories of philosophy. A fashion that was probably influenced by the fact that Aristotle, uh, in a passage from his book one of his Metaphysics, which we'll be reading later on, uh, Aristotle treated them that way, as pre-scientific people speculating about the basic principles that make nature the way it is. Pre-scientific speculation. Um, that tradition, which uh, seems to go back to Aristotle, has been sort of perpetuated in histories of philosophy. Um, but I'm not convinced that it's the only way or the best way to see the pre-Socratics. There's a second tradition that I don't want to um, dwell on, particularly, uh, that goes back actually to um, uh, one of the early Roman thinkers who wrote about um, the developing concepts of God in the early Greeks so that you get also discussions of the pre-Socratics as sort of a pre-theology. Not just a pre-science, but a pre-theology. And um, you've been reading the fragments, uh, and you probably began to think that way about things like um, um, Heraclitus Logos, or Anaxagoras, noose, mind, reason, you see. Um, there, are, there are a number of things which have kindled that line of inquiry and volumes written on the theology of the early Greek philosophers. But there is a third way that is, I think, much less traveled, uh, which I find particularly fascinating and helpful, and I suspect may be closer to where those pre-Socratic thinkers thought they were, what they thought they were doing. In order to make them out to be pre-scientific people, you have to sort of say, well, they were stimulated to ask these questions about nature by living in that natural environment and encountering people from other cultures who had mythologies of their own. Well, okay, that's plausible. But I, I think the first place to look is in their own Greek predecessors. You see? Uh, in Greek uh, literature. And um, this is what I want to pursue this afternoon. In fact, I'm not even sure it's fair to Aristotle to say that he interpreted these as pre-scientific because he saw himself as pre-scientific or scientific. I think for Plato and Aristotle, it's true that as far as they're concerned, their metaphysical views, theories of forms, studies of nature, really were part of a larger concern that they had, namely to maintain that um, there is something that is good by nature, you see. So their concern for the good in nature and in human experience is, I think, a um, more self-conscious theme, certainly on Plato's part and to a certain extent Aristotle's part, than all of the metaphysics they get into and cosmology. Uh, we'll see that as we get to Plato. But in any case, the, uh, the theme that I'm picking up on is what I've scribbled on the board here, cosmic justice. Uh, because in the predecessors of the pre-Socratics, 
the literary predecessors of the pre-Socratics, that's a notion that you get. And I'm, I'm suggesting, you see, that um, the pre-Socratics stand in continuity with these predecessors in pushing further the emerging idea of cosmic justice. This is a moral universe, you see, in which justice will out. They're pushing this emerging notion further than their literary predecessors and trying to tell us what kind of a thing nature is, that there should be some sort of rule of moral law in the universe. Do you get the overall idea? You see? Uh, that is to say, these um, earlier literary figures recognize that there are ordered processes of nature. But there are also ordered processes of moral life. that you get your due, your due reward. Or the fates get you. You see. So that you have the macrocosm, nature as a whole is ordered, law governed, the microcosm. Your moral life is ordered, law governed. And in between those two, you have sort of an in-between the emerging idea of the city-state as a law-governed order of society, you see. And there's a parallel between these three things, the orderliness of nature, the orderliness of the city-state, the orderliness of the moral life. And they see analogies between the three all the time. Now, earlier Greek mythology saw no intelligence behind natural processes producing any harmony or natural law. Um, nature and the forces behind it and the gods seemed all to be arbitrary. And there was the notion of a very impersonal kind of fate, Moira, which lurks behind the scene and then gets you. Uh, even the gods of Homer seem, at least in the Iliad, to be fickle limited in what they can do, not particularly interested in human affairs. Um, the interest in um, that mythology is, is much more in what's known as the heroic virtues. The virtue of the aristocratic hero, beauty, Wealth, status, honor, that what's, that's what makes the Greek hero. Um, but um, these heroes ignored the problems of society, the desperate need of uh, the ordinary people, and even pursued their honor to the detriment of their own real self-interest. Yes, So, um, as you read the Iliad, which I assume you have done in Western world lit, um, you, you read the Iliad and Odysseus strives in vain to return home. Yes, see. And all the while, while he's struggling, striving to get home, uh, there are 
his erstwhile friends devouring his resources and trying to seduce his wife. You remember the narrative? You see? But take a step further than the Iliad to the Odyssey, which uh, centers around uh, Odysseus' son trying to keep things straightened out at home. Very much concerned to get his father back home. In the Odyssey, the gods are becoming interested. There's a gradual evolution going on. There is less focus on the heroic virtues. And the goddess Athena gets involved and helps to secure justice, bringing Odysseus home. It's an interesting development, significant change. Now, you, you move on to Hesiod, and there's some allusion to this in uh, Stumpf, the secondary source history you're reading. Hesiod, in his Theogony, uh, seems to think that Zeus is really in charge of human affairs. And Zeus's daughter, uh, Dike, which is the Greek word later for right, justice, Zeus's daughter, Dike, actually oversees the affairs of mortals. And then when you take a look at um, Hesiod's work, uh, Works and Days, it's about ordinary mortals. About the orderedness of their lives. And in it, Hesiod calls for justice and honest labor among the common people. Now, I have a hunch that none of you have read Hesiod's Works and Days because I discovered there isn't a copy in the library. But I discovered one elsewhere. And um, here are um, a couple of selections which uh, may be of interest to you. Uh, Listen now to justice, writes Hesiod, and forget violence completely. For Cronus' son, Cronus, time, uh, Cronus' son set up this law for men. Fish, flesh, fowl, each other may devour, for right is not in them, but right he gave to men, and this is best by far. Hmm? Don't fight it out, but let justice prevail. Or this again, Those who give to every man, those from abroad and those from home, straight judgments and do not transgress the just, their city flourishes. Their people prosper too. Peace, the children's guardian, patrols the land. And Zeus, far-seeing, doesn't plan cruel wars against them upon the men who judge with honesty. Upon those men, famine and disaster never wait. They work at their appointed tasks with merriment. Those who delight in violence and wicked sinful deeds, far-seeing Zeus, the son of Cronus, plans to punish. Get the idea of a justice that comes out in the course of time. And uh, this uh, theme runs through Hesiod. It, it's very noticeable. Um, the other road is better, which leads toward just dealing, 
for justice conquers violence and triumphs in the end. Or again, the eyes of Zeus, all seeing and all knowing, behold us even now, if thus he wills. The sword of justice that this city deals in within herself will not escape his notice. It is bad to be a man of justice if the less just is to have a greater right if things are inverted. Or this again, get good measure from your neighbor and give good measure back. Okay, fair measures, scales. Return as much or better if you can so that when you are yourself in need, you will find him able to supply it. So there are interesting parallels there, incidentally, to some of the things that you find in the book of Proverbs. You see. But notice the concern for justice. The insistence that in the course of time, in Cronus' son, in the course of time, justice is going to be done. It's the very nature of things. Cosmic justice. Well, if you um, go on from Hesiod to um, Aeschylus Arestia, uh, you remember uh, the house of Atreus and the blood feud that was tearing that family apart. And yet, that blood feud is to be superseded by the rule of laws, not by the vengeful fates, but by a rule of laws that harmonizes conflicting interests. Heavenly and earthly justice must be one. Or if you're familiar with um, Sophocles Antigone, a similar story. Antigone's brother has been killed in fighting to retrieve his throne at Thebes from the usurper, Crisis. And King Croesus issues an edict that the body is to be left to rot. But Antigone defies the edict and obeys a higher law. The king threatens her with execution and demands that she confess her wrong. Did she choose flagrantly to disobey the king's edict? And here's her reply. Naturally. Since Zeus never promulgated such a law, nor will you find that justice publishes such laws to men below. I never thought your edicts had such force that they nullified the laws of heaven, which unwritten, not proclaimed, can boast a currency that everlastingly is valid, an origin beyond the birth of man. And I, whom no man's frown will frighten, am far from risking heaven's frown by flouting these, okay, the appeal to our higher justice, the justice of heaven, again. Okay. Well, my, my point in uh, pulling in those um, literary figures is really to set the context of ethical thinking into which the pre-Socratics come. After all, consider how, um, how large a place the poetry and literature of the earlier Greeks played in their education 
later. This is the stuff they were raised on, schooled on, that they celebrated, you see. So that it would be at least odd if something of this didn't appear in um, early Greek um, philosophy to the effect that this is a, a, an ordered universe. Yes, in the macrocosm. And in the microcosm, uh, we must have law-governed, ordered city-state. And in a further microcosm, the individual's moral life is part of a moral order in which justice will out. You see? So, so there's the picture. Now, uh, with that in mind, um, turn to the anthology, which I uh, asked you please to bring, and if you forgot, this is your gentle reminder. Um, it's much harder to listen, simply, than to listen and look both. Um, show and tell is a lot easier than just tell. But um, turn to uh, page eight, where we have a um, selection first, um, well, pre preceded by Thales, uh, but from the, um, the second philosopher in the whole list of pre-Socratics that we ran over last time, namely Anaximander, on page eight. Look at the bottom of the first column, uh, what he says. Um, the source of coming to be of existing things is that into which destruction too happens. All right, the processes of nature, coming to be and passing out of existence. Okay, generation, destruction. Those processes happen, and the quote, according to necessity. For they pay penalty and retribution to each other for their injustice according to the assessment of time. The assessment of time? Cronus, son? You see? The assessment of time, Cronus? Cronus, son? The assessment of time? In the course of time, things get balanced out. Now, of course, that's a passage in which it's talking about natural processes, not about moral deeds. But notice that the metaphor in the language is taken from morality and applied back to the processes of nature. Because obviously it's a familiar notion to him that there is some sort of justice that will out in the end, in the course of time. So that moral notion is applied back to the order of nature. Well, that, uh, that sentence, the one that's in quotes there, uh, ascribed to Anaximander, is one that uh, is immediately discussed in the literature on this uh, particular interpretation of the pre-Socratics. It's sort of the text for the whole thing. And if you're interested in pursuing some of the literature on it, look at the book that I've listed on the board by Werner Jaeger, a book called Paideia, which is really first steps, first principles, having to do with the learning of the Greeks. A very excellent thing on the culture and ideas of ancient Greece. So, uh, Anaximander makes um, that um, strange, perplexing comment, which I think only begins to make sense after we've read the poets. <laughs> you think? All right, uh, turn to page 12, where, um, page 12, we have Pythagoras, who has the notion of a mathematical order to nature that um, balances the opposing forces that seem to be at work. Now, um, uh, one of the things that doesn't come through in this, um, these selections is uh, the way in which 
he applies this not only to nature's processes, but also to the life of society. In fact, Pythagoras was the founder of a little community. Um, I notice that um, our editor calls it a cult. It's sometimes called a society, a city-state. Well, I suppose you could think of it like one of those uh, religious or ethical communities founded in America in idealistic days, late 19th century perhaps, of which there are several strewn around the Midwest as well as in the um, Anabaptist uh, Mennonite uh, groups in various parts of the country. That is to say, a morally idealistic community living together and ordering their lives in what we think of as countercultural ways. You know well, Pythagoras founded a group of that sort. A group in which there was to be this harmony of opposing interests, a balance of opposing influences and forces at work in the community a well-ordered, rationally governed life characterized by justice. Now, the word that he uses is um, uh, the word peras, which, as those of you who are into Greek know, means a border or a boundary. The Greeks know that. The rest of you barbarians know it now. Um, uh, so he, he distinguishes between peras, which is order, and the other side of the coin, the opposing force, is apiron, that which is undefined, unlimited. You remember that's the term that Anaximander had used for the basic stuff, is an unlimited, undefinable something. You see? So in addition to that sort of phenomenon which Anaximander was aware of, namely that the underlying stuff seems to have all sorts of unmanageable, undefinable properties about it, but it'll all come out in the wash in the course of time, says Anaximander. Now Pythagoras goes one step further and says, there is actually an intelligible order to nature, peras. And in the world of nature, we can trace the order mathematically. Well, the way in which they work that out in society is reflected in um, some of the uh, verbalisms, the dicta in the second column on, one f on page 12. Um, Let's see, number six. Follow the gods and restrain your tongue. Stir not the fire with iron. Why not? Well, why do you think the um, handle on the tongs you use on the barbecue has wood on it? Rather than just picking up iron to take things off the barbecue. You get the idea? You see, reason tells you that there is going to be some sort of clash, some sort of pain if you stir the fire with iron. Reason stakes out the limits to such sorts of things. And uh, you, you can see all sorts of dietary restrictions as you go down the, uh, the column. 37 and 8, abstain from beans, abstain from living things. Uh, for whatever uh, reasons, they have dietary proposals, ruling their lives by reason. Well, um, all right, Pythagoras. Um, on page, let's see, page 13, Xenophanes was an individual that wasn't included in my list. 
Um, he's not discussed by Stumpf and is often omitted from discussions of the pre-Socratics. And I think that may be a prejudice created by viewing the Socratics as uh, pre-scientific thinkers, because Xenophanes really doesn't say much about nature at all. So you can hardly think of him as a pre-scientific thinker. So, leave Xenophanes out. Ah, but today we're not talking about the pre-Socratics as pre-scientific thinkers, we're thinking of them as uh, ethical thinkers. So what does the Xenophanes have to say? Well, notice on the first column on page 13, bottom of the page, he talks about Homer and Hesiod, who ascribed to the gods whatever is infamy and reproach among men. Theft, adultery, deceiving each other. You see, now, I take that to be more a criticism of the gods than of Homer and Hesiod who reported on the gods. But uh, what he's doing is pointing out, uh, obviously, that that is the kind of life, theft and adultery and deceiving each other, which needs to be brought under some kind of just control. And yet the gods are guilty of things that men are hanged for every day, you see. And so in contrast to that kind of gods, Xenophanes turns in a loftier direction. He goes on, mortals suppose that the gods are born and have clothes and voices and shapes like our own. But if oxes and horses and lions had hands and could paint with their hands and fashion works as men do, they'd paint horse-like images of gods and the oxen would paint ox-like images of gods and each would fashion bodies like their own. So the Ethiopians consider the gods flat-nosed and black, the Thracians blue-eyed and red-haired, but there is only one god, among gods and men the greatest, not at all like mortals in body or mind. He sees as a whole, thinks as a whole, hears as a whole, and without toil, because there are no opposites in conflict, Without toil, he moves everything by just the thought of his mind. He thinks, and it's done. Now, there's a conception of a purely rational, immaterial being emerging among the Greeks. You see. But what's the point of it? The point is not some sort of theological or metaphysical speculation. The point is to find an alternative to the debasing conceptions of the gods among the Greeks. One that upholds ordered unity in life, in society, in the cosmos. Everything comes from this one God. Well, for that reason, Xenophanes is sometimes um, discussed along with Parmenides, Zeno, and the Eleatics. You remember the absolute monists? They said that everything is one without division, without plurality, without change, as if Xenophanes is pointing in a similar direction. Well, he was not a man of Elia, he was not an Eleatic, he was an independent thinker elsewhere. And uh, his motivation seems to be entirely in terms of this moral vision of cosmic justice. Well, from uh, Xenophanes on 13, turn to Heraclitus. Heraclitus, 15 and following. And you remember I had linked Heraclitus and Pythagoras, suggesting that they're double aspect monists two sides to nature, the ordered and the disordered, the change and the permanent ordered unity of things. Well, you find that in Heraclitus. Um, first column towards the bottom of the page, those awake have one ordered universe in common. Uh, but in sleep, 
uh, all those in sleep, each turns away to his own world. Okay? Now, are you awake or are you asleep? That's what he's asking. <laughs> the thinking faculty is in common to all, he goes on. So if you're awake, if you're thinking, you'll see there has to be one ordered universe that is common to all men. We live in one and the same ordered universe with one and the same ordered laws for all, one and the same justice for all, macrocosm, microcosm. And so of the logos, there's that uh, word we mentioned last time, of that logos, which is as I describe it, men always prove to be uncomprehending before they've heard it and once they've heard it, for although all things happen according to this logos, men are like people of no experience, even when they experience words and deeds as I explain, and so forth. Well, he doesn't tell us what it is, but all things happen according to this logos. So he goes on, it's necessary to follow this, this common, this universal view of one ordered universe. For although the logos is in common to all, Many live as though they had private understandings, those dreams in the night when they're asleep. You see? Now, if there is a universal order, if there is a universal law of reason, you see, then rational conclusions will really be, should really be the same for everybody. All in common. So listen not to me, but to the Logos. You see, not to a private understanding, but to the Logos, cosmic reason. It's wise to agree that all things are one. And so the Logos concept emerges out of this whole theme of cosmic order and cosmic justice. Well, um, the subsequent passages uh, come back to the same theme, not in those words. Look on the second page, um, a little over halfway down. What is in opposition is in concert. From what differs comes the most beautiful harmony. Harmony. And then war is the father of all and the king of all. That is to say, it's the clash of opposite in a process of change which seems to underlie Nietzsche's processes. So you, he says, one must know that war is common. It's universal. Justice is found through strife. All things happen through strife and necessity. But in the course of time, the laws of justice, logos, you see. Uh, notice the comments he makes about Homer in the second column, about a third of the way down. Homer deserves to be thrown out of the contests and whipped. Yeah, for the virtues that he espoused, those heroic virtues. The Greek jocks, you see. Um, I trust that a Wheaton jocks are not like Greek ones in those regards, with the wrong values, you see. The most popular teacher is Hesiod. Of him, people think he knew most, who... Um, didn't even know day and night that they're one. He hadn't pressed into the cosmology of the thing. You see. Um, and then uh, towards the bottom of the column, to God all things are beautiful and good and just, but men have supposed some things to be unjust and some just. Now that passage has been taken two ways. One, espousing the view of God, singular, perhaps Logos. 
that everything in the end works out right, justly. The other taking the view that this is critical of the Greek gods, who let anything go, and said, oh, that's all right. And some men have been more discerning than that, calling some things just and some unjust. <laughs> now, which way is it meant? I don't know. Okay. And then in 17 in the first column, if happiness lay in bodily pleasures, oh yeah, there were the hedonists of that day too. If happiness lay in bodily pleasures, we would call oxen happy when they find vetch to eat. Okay, Aristotle says something similar. If pleasure is the highest end of man, then I suppose you could call a healthy cabbage happy or a pig wallowing in the stuff. You see. Uh, okay, uh, no, there's something more. Um, and the next, um, next saying right after that one, it's not good for men to obtain all they wish. Then the next, sane thinking is the greatest virtue. Wisdom is speaking the truth and acting according to nature, paying heed. According to the moral order of nature. So, um, Heraclitus, there's this logos concept is, um, is a fascinating one. Um, the, the term, if you, if you trace its meaning in um, Greek language, in antiquity, uh, it can mean um, not simply a, um, a speech that's heard, an utterance. The emphasis is rather on the, um, the rationality of it. It's the word from which we get our word logic, you see. Um, it's, um, it sometimes means measure, in measuring out goods that are being sold. Balance, harmony, in harmonizing opposing influence, opposing forces, you see. In other words, it's that which gives order, value, meaning to life. Now, I think there's an echo of that in the first gospel of, first chapter of John's gospel, when John begins in Archaean Halagos, in the beginning was the Logos. Meaning that in the beginning there was order, meaning to life. The Logos, by whom and for whom all things were made. So forth. Well, this is the beginning of that Logos notion then in, uh, in Heraclitus. Um, turn uh, lastly in this, uh, or next to lastly in this rundown, to Anaxagoras on page 41. Incidentally, you can see where Kaufman's interest is because of all those pages he puts in on Zeno's paradoxes. He really loves to play with those paradoxes having to do with cosmology and nature. Uh, he, he's not particularly interested in the ethical question. But um, turn to Anaxagoras on page 41. Now, you remember Anaxagoras was one of the pluralists who held that there were as many different elements as there are different qualities, properties. So there is a seed of this, a seed of that, a seed of all the other things uh, that can be observed or identified, okay? And that uh, running through this in order to give it order, harmony, bring an ordered world of nature into being, uh, there is this cosmic noose 
mind, intelligence, reason, however the word noose happens to be translated. Okay. Now look in the second column then on page 41. Second column, page 41. Um, the paragraph numbered 11, in, in everything there is a portion of everything except mind. Some things contain mind also. Okay, this vast variety of different seeds of everything going to make up our bodies with all the multitudinous variety of properties that various aspects of the body have. Okay. Seeds of everything. Now, in um, some, in everything, there is a portion of everything, but some things contain mind also. Not everything contains mind. You see. A um, handful of slime gives no evidence of noose. You see? But a thinking human being does. Now, just where in between he would draw the line, of course, is an interesting question. Uh, depending whether you think of noose as simply the giving of intelligence of a conscious sort, or noose as evidenced in orderedness. Okay, some ordered, cohesive unity that gives a thing identity that's distinguishable and definable. Or whether you think of nous, as the Greeks did of soul, as that which gives life and animates. Okay, in which case a hunk of iron would have no nous, but a cabbage would. So, um, various questions that can arise about this. But he focuses on the concept mind, noose. Now, other things, he goes on, all contain a part of everything. But mind is infinite and self-ruling, is mixed with no thing that is alone by itself. If it were not by itself, it were mixed, it would have had a share of all things, if it were mixed with anything. Um, then he goes on further down. It is the finest of all things, the purest, has complete understanding of everything, the greatest power. All things that have life, both the greater and the less, are ruled by mind. Well, they participate in mind in some way. Do they have mind in them? Or are they ruled from outside? by some external mind. Mind took command of the universal revolution. Revolution not in the sense of an overthrow of authority, but in the sense of that cosmic vortex in which everything is twisted around together as the Greeks conceived. Okay. That primal chaos. Mind took command of that universal revolution so as to make things revolve at the outset, and then from all of that revolving mess of stuff, separates off, draws off the various ordered kinds of things into an ordered cosmos. Well, it almost sounds as if the King James translators may have read um, an Exagoras. In the beginning, the earth was without form and void. And God said, and it was so. Now, I say almost. Perhaps they did. After all, um, King James Version was translated after the Renaissance of learning, which brought Greek thought back into the consciousness. In, in fact, um, the Roman Cicero, in his book on the nature of the gods, I alluded to it earlier, in his book on the nature of the gods, Cicero says, the first human thinker to hold that the orderly disposition of the universe is designed and perfected 
by the rational power of an infinite mind was Anaxagoras. Now, notice um, what this um, Anaxagoras mind does, you see. Don't say that Anaxagoras' mind is a creator. Uh, certainly not in any Judeo-Christian sense, in which um, we, we think of creation, of course, as uh, ex nihilo, out of nothing. No prior materials, no primal chaos, no primal glop of any sort. You see. Uh, no, rather what an examander's mind is, does is to bring order out of chaos. More of a shaper, a fashioner, an architect uh, than a creator bringing things into being out of nothing. But um, this seems to be uh, approaching the, the pinnacle of how far these people go. Plato isn't satisfied with Anaxagoras. Anaxagoras knows in a number of places in his dialogues, he's critical of the man, because he sees order, but he fails to see that there is purpose as well in the way things are made. Oh, yes. Now, I said that Anaximander, I said last time, Anaximander uh, seems to have a teleological view, an ordered universe. Yes, but not by virtue of intelligent conscious purpose. In fact, Plato may not have a notion of intelligent conscious purpose. His concept of purpose seems to be unconscious, though intelligent. So he, he's criticizing Anaximander for not seeing an end-oriented natural process. Nature's processes are ordered, but not ordered to achieve ends. And it's that achievement of ends that Plato is going to be concerned about, and Aristotle, and the whole medieval tradition. Well, um, that's the picture. Yet, there is a counterforce. You know, they say there's always opposites. Well, there's an opposite to all of this. And maybe uh, you spotted it in your reading that the opposite is Democritus. Did you catch that? The opposite is Democritus. Yet, yeah, Democritus has no noose has no logos, you see. Uh, Democritus views the order of the cosmos as being the result of sheer chance, the chance conglomeration of inert particles, atoms, whirling around in a cosmic vortex, producing oh, the particular combination of things which survived. It's a purely mechanistic account. So Democritus is not likely to celebrate the natural order like the others do. Democritus is not likely to find a microcosm in the law-governed city-state. He's not likely to stress cosmic justice. And indeed, that's what you find in Democritus. If you look at page 44, middle of the second column, everything happens according to necessity. The cause of coming into being is the whirl, that cosmic vortex that he calls necessity. Things collide, become entangled, form larger substances, so on and so forth. And then in the next column at the very bottom, first column of 45, notice this about aesthetic qualities. 
sweet exists by convention. Bitter by convention. Color by convention. And when you turn to where he talks about matters of ethics on 47, the very bottom of the second column, pleasure and the absence of pleasure are the criteria of what is profitable and what is not. Or the very bottom of um, 48, paragraph 188, the criterion of the advantageous and disadvantageous is enjoyment, lack of enjoyment. Um, the very bottom of 49, paragraph 200, people are fools who live without enjoyment. Why? Because in a world of sheer chance with no intrinsic order that ensures that right will out, eat, drink, and be merry. You see. Now, admittedly, um, he would um, uh, recommend temperance in your eating and drinking and merriment uh, because too much of it tends to cause pain rather than pleasure. Don't you know? You see? So you get a very different ethic resulting from Democritus' mechanistic materialism than you do from these others who are pondering, reflecting on the idea of an ordered, law-governed creation of which we're part so that a law-governed life should be part of the whole picture. Well, next time we'll be looking at the sophists and Socrates and notice how at least some of the sophists seem to be closer to Democritus and without the least bit of interest or belief in a law-governed cosmos. You see. And so the dichotomy between these two views, if you like, these two worldviews, these two worldviews, uh, before we, uh, we even get to Plato, surfaces. Yes, and it's into that conflict between worldviews that Plato steps, that Socrates emerges, and so forth, speaking to precisely the issues which this conflict of worldviews poses. Well, by my chronometer, we have five minutes before time, which means five minutes for feedback. You have sat silently as if this were a sermon instead of a class. Okay, um, what do you want to ask? Yeah. I have a question. Uh, you said Plato finds an exorgus uh, not teleological enough? Or yeah, not teleological enough. It depends how you define teleology. But... Um, yeah, um, teleology is usually spoken of with reference to belief in a natural order and purpose, you see. But sometimes you find it used for just one of these, the order without the purpose. And, that was Anaxagoras. and Anaxagoras seems to have order with intelligence behind it but no inherent purpose. And Plato finds fault with that. So yes. Uh, Plato wants to say that natural processes um, are end achieving. Or if you like, there are ideals inherent in all natural processes as to what they should accomplish. Okay. Uh, you know, you're familiar perhaps with teleological arguments for the existence of God. Some people speak of an argument simply from the orderedness of nature as a teleological argument. Uh, but a full-blown teleological argument would be the kind of orderedness which gives evidence of intelligent purpose. So the, the, the terms are ambiguous ones. Yeah, um, Ruth.
Democritus that, that things exist by convention that um, the empiricists picked up on the other concept of con you know, constant conjunction? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, you know, I said last time that the pre-Socratics sort of pose the agenda for Western philosophy. Um, there's a sense in which they also stake out the alternatives. You see, empiricism versus speculative rationalism. Um, a purely materialistic view versus something other than just the material view. Yeah, very much so. A hedonistic ethic versus an ethic of moral law. Yeah. In fact, I, I have a friend who, um, th this sounds like a horrible thing to do, uh, but uh, as I understand it, he used to introduce people to philosophy. He was teaching in a seminary, but he used to introduce people to philosophy who had never had any philosophy by taking them through the pre-Socratics. Now, compare that with the wonderful intro to philosophy course you had here under the label Issues and Worldviews, and you see a difference. But on the other hand, you can see that it's possible. You see, it's possible. Obviously, you'd have to supply an awful lot in addition. But, um, yeah, it sets the agenda. And for that matter, it poses the main alternatives. Right. Yes? Yeah, the, um, the double aspect in Pythagoras is peras and a pyron. Limitation and unlimited um, chaos. In Heraclitus, it's logos and the uh, fiery vapor. Oops, I said vapor, fiery vapor, which uh, is the way he talks about the natural elements. So um, these are the two aspects of one and the same thing. Notice that uh, not only is the emerging God in this account not an ex nihilo creator, the emerging God isn't really a transcendent God. In Pythagoras and Heraclitus, just another aspect of nature. You see, it's almost a pantheistic anticipation. Um, and Aximander comes perhaps closer in implying that this noose is always unmixed. It never is mixed up with all the elements. So, 